You're listening to Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. Dash pay rising, the internet of unsecure things, Cloudflare bleeds, Shaw One is done, son, and DNA based computers. All this and more in episode 196 here on Wednesday, March 1st, 2017. Darren? JJ, in the traditional markets, we have gold at $1,249, silver's at $18.39. Oil is trading at $53.67. The Dow is up to 21115 And the 30-year Treasury, the yield is up. Everything's been up in this category from to, to 3.071. Excellent. Uh, Randy, can you give us crypto markets? Sure. We've got some ups here, too. Bitcoin is up at 1224 Ethereum is at 1689 Dash all the way up to $45, just climbing significantly. Zcash, $41.09. And Monero, Twelve thirty-six. Excellent. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss out on a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, LBRY, and more. And our listeners will definitely want to check out our ranting and raving edition if they didn't hear it. That came out Monday. That's right, Darren. Uh, we've got the bonus episode that came out on Monday, and it, it features some uh, some of the discussions surrounding the Bitcoin block size debate. Well, basically, if anyone was listening last week, we had special guest, uh, one of our friends, Andy, who works for a Bitcoin ATM company. And as soon as we finished recording the show, Darren and Andy kept talking uh, about some of their frustrations. And, and Darren said, well, gosh, I w- we should have a rant and rave version of the show. When can we record it? And uh, turned to JJ and said, well, as soon as you're done... Uh, as soon as you're done editing out the audio from the last episode, let's let's hit record, and we did. So, little bonus if anyone wants to listen to some more about uh, our feelings on Bitcoin and uh, Dash and uh, just privacy. And that was one of Andy's biggest talking points. I think was privacy and encryption and security and things like that. So, hearing uh, what what he likes about Monero. Uh, over Zcash and some other items like that. So check it out on neocashradio.com. That's right. And you can check out Neocash Radio for all the show notes and more episodes as well. This is, as we said, episode 196. So getting right to it, Randy, the story, uh, one of the big stories this week, of course, is the Cloudflare bleed. Uh, yeah. Is that is cloud bleed? They're is calling that? it cloud bleed. Yeah. So there was the heart bleed uh, data breach a while ago. They're calling this one cloud bleed. So Cloudflare is a content delivery network that I, that helps kind of um, get websites delivered to your screen. They help a lot of bigger companies make sure that their data is always available um, when users want to get it. And so they have proxies and all sorts of other things that make sure data gets delivered quickly. Um, they're trusted by millions of domains uh, so much so that they're even g- given basically control over like a HTTPS certificates and things like that. So, uh, however, <laughs> last uh, last week it was revealed uh, Tavis Ormandy or Ormandy from Google's Project Zero uh, contacted Cloudflare to report that they had a security problem with some of their servers. Uh, it turns out that there was corrupted web pages being returned by some of the HTTP requests going through Cloudflare, and it was pumping out uh, unencrypted. Uh, data basically it was just spraying out data uh, that looked like a corrupted web page but oftentimes it would contain um, it could contain anything cookies authentication keys private keys for a wallet so maybe not your password but you could you could stumble upon someone else's authentication token and be able to function uh, as if you were that person Um, so it's been doing this since september and it's, it looks like some of that data has even been cached by search engines. So um, Cloudflare was made aware of it, and they were kind of trying to sort all of that out before a big release was made uh, to tell people about this. They wanted to try to clear as much of the web cache as they could. Uh, Uber, Fitbit, lots of other big companies, but also several cryptocurrency exchanges. So Coinbase, that's where I first saw it. There was a warning from Coinbase uh, telling users to change their passwords. And if they enabled uh, two-factor authentication recently, it's actually possible that the two-factor authentication secret could be leaked. So they're advising users to disable and re-enable uh, their 2FA and to change their passwords. So Coinbase, Poloniex, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, those are just a couple. Um, def- and, and definitely definitely look online and see if uh, a site that you use has been affected. Blockchain.info. It, also, okay. I didn't see that list. one, but yeah, definitely uh, something to be aware of. And it, it looks like this wasn't bad too bad it doesn't look like anything <laughs> how, how do you horrendous? Really judge whether well, something is well that bad cl- clearly it's not too bad because somebody contacted them and told you hey you got a problem right. okay. it's not somebody that found it out and went 
and went around and, and exploited it and then uh, I, and then cloud I think, I think what you're probably. alluding to Darren is is a lot of the stories surrounding the big companies and banks that have had 80 million users addresses and names and all that hacked it usually comes out like a year after two years removed from the actual hack or, or there's a big gap in, in time but uh well it's, project zero is is a team of security analysts that uh, is employed by Google and they are supposed to be finding quote uh, zero day vulnerabilities so they're they're out looking for these kinds of things uh, they're white hat hackers although uh, the person who discovered this also noted that um, Cloudflare did have a bug bounty program but the top tier prize was a Cloudflare t-shirt which led him to comment that he didn't think they took their bug bounty program too seriously Wow that's a very good point very good point well uh, moving on in a t- Talking about our next story, another vulnerability that's sort of uh, more, I get more publicized. This one here, uh, the, the uh, SHA One crypto cryptographic hashing algorithm. Uh, who wants to take this one here? Yeah, so I'll take it. So, um, a hash function is something that um, that uh, allows you to prove that you know something without telling people what it is. Basically, if you have a secret that you want to divulge in the future, you can publish the hash. And then, which is basically just a number that's associated with that data, and then, uh, and then, if you publish that data in the future, anybody can hash that data and see that yes, you had the correct hash. And the whole idea behind a hash function, it's hard to go from the hash to the original data. And so, what 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 happens when uh, these hash functions get broken? And that happens from time to time, um, as technology gets better and all that they're able to basically maybe insert some extra data at the end of the file or uh, put change the data in some way so that they can actually create a, a given hash. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. So, so, um, so that, there's only so many hashes that each algorithm is capable of producing, and that's based right. on which you know, there, yeah, like, there are different algorithms that, that provide different lengths of strings and different... You know, yeah, and like the length of the string kind of determines exactly how many different yeah. so, Sha, solutions. Sha, SHA 256 has two to the 256, which is actually a very large number, uh, possible outputs of its hash function. And, um, and the hash functions are used in security all the time. Sometimes, if you have an account at a website, they won't store your password, they'll store the hash of the password, which, um, if somebody gets the hash of the password, they can't use that to log on. And, uh, there, there, there's all kinds of things. Now, SHA-1 is is an older hash function, and I don't think it's in serious use anymore. So the fact that it's... Uh, well, it's still being used for HTTPS certificates, but they're going to be phasing that out. Um, yeah, they should have already is, phased that it, out. It is about 20 years old, and uh, yeah, this was basically a cry for them to upgrade and start using SHA-256. And if, if you wanted to learn a little bit more about hashing functions, we actually... JJ and I uh, made a video a while ago called Decrypting Bitcoin, That's right. uh, Blockchain Technology Explained, and it, it goes into it a little bit. Basically, what Darren was talking about earlier is called a pre-commitment key, where, yeah, you're sharing a hash and showing that this, um, when the data is eventually released, they can show without uh, you know mathematical doubt that this was, in fact, the data that was being referenced before, um, that there would be no way to... Um, change the data since after sharing the hash because then the two output hashes once the if the data were changed it would put, create a different output so what these researchers have done is actually demonstrated what's called a collision and it's so they've created two different pdfs with different content but they're putting out an identical hash on sha1 and that should not happen now it took nine quintillion computations and the equivalent of 6,500 years of single CPU computations uh, for just phase one of the collision and then another 110 years of single GPU to finish phase two. So basically uh, renting out cloud computers, uh, Amazon Web Services or Google's um, you know, cloud services, you can set a lot of computing power on something like this. And um, it, it sounds like a really long time, but it, this is actually 100,000 times faster than just a brute force attack on SHA-1. So... They're showing that this can actually come down quite a bit in price. They're saying by next year, doing something like this could cost as little as like $110,000, which may be a lot to you and me, but the potential reward for being able to show, to be able to submit some kind of file that looks like a file that this company is already using that might siphon something off for you. you know, there's all kinds of things that coders can do to uh, make this bad. But again, they're moving away from this algorithm and now they just have a, a more concrete reason to. 
Right. Yeah. So the uh, the shattered technique is what they were, they were the shattered. I guess. Oh, I yeah. get it. Right. They could go right to shot three for all I for all I'm concerned. Right. So. Uh, so basically, it's it's I mean it's it's sort of expected that this was going to happen, and the security and, and security people warned that you know as technology has increased, that the likelihood of shot one becoming compromised is is very likely. It so gets more and more, more and, and more. more right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like with if you had a cryptocurrency you were managing. Uh, at some point, you might want to change some of the hash functions it uses, but uh, usually there's no rush on these things. All right. Well, uh, moving on and talking about a another story, the Internet of Unsecure Things. I think we're going to have a reoccurring theme with this because we've already talked about it a lot on the show, Neocache Radio, and you can check out those episodes at neocacheradio.com. But this is talking about a smart teddy bear security hazard. Now, I mean, how could a toy really be a security hazard? Well... Spiral Toys has a teddy bear that connects with inter- the internet. It actually connects to a, a smartphone and allows parents and children to exchange voice messages. Aww. These cloud pet these cloud pet toys store these messages on customer and customer data on a database, and it turns out it isn't behind a firewall or even password protected. So this hmm. Mongo database that they stored it on has no protections <laughs> whatsoever. And there are certain uh, websites that uh, search engines that will find vulnerable databases, and so security security people, as well as whomever else decided to to go to it, has found this database containing eighty uh, eight hundred thousand customer login credentials and two million recorded messages. Now the news gets worse. Uh, security researcher gets worse. Paul Stone found that the toys could be remotely controlled by anyone in range with a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> the toys use no contri- con- uh, encryption or Bluetooth pairing security measures. Just connect with the free app. Once connected, you can send a message that will silently turn on recording. And once you're done that- with that, you can also download the audio recording to your smartphone. Wow. Now, just a few days before the news of Cloud Pets, uh, Germany's telecommu- telecommunications watchdog, the Federal Network Agency, warned parents that my friend Kayla Dolls could be used to remotely spy on homes. Dow was banned in Germany. The issues minor, uh, mirror that of the smart teddy bear. The app uses no security protocols, and anyone in range can take control of dolls. The dolls are made by Genesis Toys and distributed by the Vivid Toy Group. The doll is also being scrutinized in the United States. This past December, advocacy, advocacy groups, uh, a whole bunch of them, uh, filed a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. The complaint details how the voice data is sent to Nuance Communications Incorporated where it's converted from audio to text. Mm. This audio to text then works through the API, and, and can. Uh, this is how you can give the dial commands. The report goes on to explain how the user terms and conditions allow for nuance to use the voice data for improving company products and services. And then finally, the report, report points out that, quote, nuance services and products include voice biometric solutions sold to military, intelligence, and law enforcement agencies, unquote. The service they mention is called Nuance Identifier, a, quote, highly accurate voice biometric solution that allows public security officials to quickly and easily identify known individuals through their voice within large audio data sets, unquote. And, quote, Nuance claims to have over 30 million voice prints enrolled in voice biometric system, unquote. Also, from the complaint, Mm. if, quote, if you were, this is from their user terms and agreement, if you are under 18 or would otherwise be required to have parent or guardian consent to share information with Nuance, you should not send any information about yourself to us. (laughs) But keep them with our dolls. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they're marketed. You can look at them. They're marketed to people under 18, right? Oh, yeah. They're marketed to children. (laughs) And so, like, this is, this is a, a, a biometric collecting voice prints agency if you will working yeah. with the federal agencies that private company that that is basically offering these compromised toys not only are they collecting these voice prints from all these children and in, and oftentimes if you look at this the report is actually comprehensive in what they talk about but these these dolls ask you where you are where your physical address is things like that a lot of different information and and then it's all collected, of course, and added to the nuances identifier bat- uh, database. And wow. now, you know, the biometric uh, collection is is happening. Yeah, and we're seeing that with things like Alexa and, of course, Siri and OK Google on your phones. Um, it, it's interesting, actually, someone was talking the other day about how um, they were using Signal, which is an encrypted messaging system, um, basically to do encrypted text messages. They were using it, but they were doing talk to type and 
it didn't occur to them that their audio was being sent unencrypted uh, out to Siri or OK Google to be converted to text to go back to the phone as a command. And so, I'm, um, you know, there's things that like that you have to think about if you are concerned no, about like, privacy and encryption. So I had a similar thought to using Signal. I was typing my message, right? No voice to text. And Google was trying to uh, spell check everything. Mm. So even if you type it, you you still have given Google pretty much what you typed. So uh, it right. would only have one it's, side of well, the conversation. That's, that's your Android device, which it has the uh, built-in uh, dic- dictionary. Yes, and, yes. And it's not checking. Signal's fault. I'm just saying that if you're trying to be uh, private, uh, <laughs> uh, if Google is uh, spell checking what you're doing live, live, right? Uh, I wouldn't expect it to be private. Hmm. Uh, and moving on, more vulnerabilities to talk about here. Password management apps are riddled with flaws. Team SIK has published a report detailing the numerous flaws in the top nine password apps available for Android on Google Play. Oh, man. The apps examined LastPass, Keeper, OnePassword, MyPasswords, Dashlane Password Manager, Info- Informaticores Password Manager, FSecureKey, KeepSafe, and Avast Passwords. And a total of 26 security flaws have been found by the security firm. The good news is that it, as of this report, all the vulnerabilities have been fixed by the vendors. So we users are strongly advised to update their apps. So, uh, you know, the, the, the security I holes are so everywhere. I am so ready to move past passwords. I mean, what's what's next? I, I know there's other well, stuff out there. Well, you could skip but... to biometrics. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I, that's... I am a little bit wary of biometrics. I don't like that idea. Uh, but uh, there, you know, you could have a private key and and just sign a message to get on a website to show who you are. And I, I think right. that would be a lot better. I, I could imagine a device. It's like a USB key. You plug in and you say sign into the site, and it just signs you in, and uh, you're done. Uh, so, uh, and that would be more secure than a password. Yeah, unfortunately, USB devices and USB itself it has a history of security problems, and and yeah. most places actually will disable the USB ports on uh, publicly available computers because oh. of the exploits that you can perform. That, but simply like that skimmers, might be... yeah, not not only really skimmers, you can just load a device, and it automatically. Uh, most computers will automatically go and look what's on there, mm-hmm. and, and well, with some some of the programs, it will start. Well, Malware right there. What, oh, okay. what we did in the good old days on IRC was uh, in order to verify you, you were who you said you were, uh, you, you typed a command, you got a, a piece of text, and you uh, signed that piece of text, and you sent it back. And that verified who you are. So I'm just thinking if that could somehow be streamlined, that would be pretty, pretty good. Like if you're in a work environment, an NSC probably could do the same thing with the signing and uh, sure, and, uh, that that would work too. Yeah, so so I mean, I mean, I'm not really thinking USB is the end sure. all be all, but there there could be a signature thing. And then at the, uh, the the what we did on IRC, it changed after a while. You got a choice: you could either sign something with your with your key, or you could decrypt something. So it just sent you something encrypted, and if you could decrypt it with your private key and send it back, then you were who you said you were. So I, I thought that was a little bit better. The uh, yeah, the only, okay, that's cool, and. uh I mean, the only issue I see with that is that they 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 know your private key if they made the encryption based off your private key. No, no, you, I can make my private. No, them, we, they they sent you something to decrypt. Well, what, yeah, but I I told them my public key ahead of time. Okay, so they based so, it off. Okay. So I'm I'm trying to get a I get you. established identity. So first I register with my public key, and then every time I log in, I need my private key. All right, and, well, and I created that pair. We've not been them. talking about the oil situation, the price of oil. We always track it here on the show at the, at the top of the show, and then there's usually not a lot of news about it. Uh, a little update for you: OPEC's oil glut gamble has cost its members two trillion dollars. Talking to the media in Egypt, the cartel's director Mohamed Barkinino, um, I think that's how you pronounce it, said that about half of it, uh, half the loss, about one trillion uh, worth of the loss, is chalked up to lost revenue while the rest is due to uh, failed capital investments and canceled projects. So the the whole plan, you know, when we first talked about this, the idea was to get the fracking to stop and it sort of push all those companies out of business because it was no longer profitable. Well, they've certainly felt the same pains uh, in, in the cartel. So moving on, uh, talking about computers based on DNA. Now, I think you know, this is something really big uh, t- to talk about there. We mentioned quantum computers a lot on the yes, show. Yes, yes. But this, uh, and, and researchers, now imagine a computer based on biological molecules rather than silicon. 
Researchers at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom have demonstrated the feasibility of engineering a non-deterministic universal Turing machine. <gasps> really? A machine that grows as it computes. The study will be published in the Journal of Royal Society Interface. Professor King from Manchester School of Computer Science explains why the potential of speed could be vast. Oh, Quote, wow. imagine a computer that is searching a maze and comes to a choice point. One pass leading left, the other right. Electronic computers need to choose which path to follow first. But our computer doesn't need to choose, for it can replicate itself and follow both paths at the same time, thus finding the answer faster. Now, rather than a binary alphabet of a one or a zero, the DNA computer would use a four-character gener- genetic alphabet, A, G, C, and T, uh, each of the different proteins that's in DNA. Yeah. So this is big news. Yeah, here. that's big news. So I, when you first said this, I thought of something I read in Scientific American when I was maybe in high school or something, where they found out how to uh, basically set up DNA and then mix it together, and basically the DNA would er- interact with itself and, and do a very advanced computation and get the answer, and it would do it a lot quicker than a computer could. Uh, so that had a, a very uh, profound impact because it's you can do very specialized problems this way. But with what you said, J.J., about a Turing complete uh, system, this is something that you could program. You could uh, you could uh, redo. Uh, you try again, and uh, you don't have to uh, have the problem in mind when you set out to solve it. You, you, you can. Uh, so uh, you're this, saying that that this the, is huge. The old way of doing it required a lot of setup, but the the computing was fast and it was it was really good. Yeah, but it, it just took forever to is, set up each problem. If this is Turing complete, that means you can just type up something in a, in a language, in a, a computer language, right. And send it off to the lab and say, "Hey, please do this," and they they can just run it, right? And uh, so so that should be, uh, and, and you know uh, this, yeah, amazing. it's really big. And, and I, I think a couple of weeks ago, I had I had the editorial, the one week where we didn't have an actual show, and I talked about how the future of technology would most likely mimic organic, uh, or organic and carbon based life forms because that's sort of what evolution. Has, has given us as the most successful machines in the world are are these organic life forms that we're in right now, or or we are, whichever view, viewpoint you have, which is totally your thing. Uh, but, you know, having a computer that's, that uses DNA to solve problems really brings the, uh, the singularity, if you will, much closer. The whole idea of man and machine melding, and if you are, you know, a part of that, that uh, I guess, difficulty to understand was... Well, how are you going to get a silicon and chip thing to work with my skin and my body and, you know, my physical uh, organic structure? But I think in the future, computers based on DNA won't have that sort of problem this, this, interfacing. This might have, have applications in biology because maybe some computations are happening in our body and we just don't know it. Or maybe, That's true. You know, who knows? Uh, because the DNA, there's all kinds of mysteries about DNA. People know it exists. They know it has... If you have DNA a certain way, you get specific traits. They know that as a fact, but there's there's all these unknowns. There's what in the in any genome. There's what's called junk DNA. There's DNA that doesn't seem to do anything. Then there's epigenetics, which is a a, a fairly new uh, subject where uh, environmental factors can affect the t- expression of traits. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of this? Like if if you have if you were malnutritioned, if you were malnourished okay. th- throughout your life, uh, you might have a short kid. Okay, and it's it's genetic, but it's not as a reaction. Yeah. the offspring is is less requiring a resource. Yeah, exactly, because that's that's evolutionarily advantaged. When you're in a situation where you don't have enough food, hey, let's make people that need less food. Right, they're shorter, and um, and but but scientists, I don't believe, understand how that process works. How an environmental factor can actually affect. The genetic expression, it doesn't really affect the genome. It just affects which traits are expressed. So g- genes are turned off and on based on environmental factors. There's strong evidence of that. But uh, the understanding of this is not happening. Right. Right. And, and I think, you know, there's there's a lot of factors that go into this. And and I am definitely not a genetic a I'm not either. I'm a math. I, I, can't, I can't really speak to that science. I think it's exciting. And I think... But, uh, this what they're talking about here with the uh, the DNA based computer, um, and just sort of leapfrogging the quantum computers. But, but this is going to allow computer scientists and and these molecular biologists to to uh, 
work together yeah. and uh, basically start specializing where you have people that have a computer science background that have very specialized talents and people with this molecular biology background that have very specialized talents. They're going to be able to interface very well with a Turing complete biological or biological molecular uh, computer. Well, and one thing I was thinking about when I first, uh, I, I, w- I actually went to college briefly for computer science and one thing that was, you know, on my mind, and I think pretty much everybody who's ever thought of binary and programming is like, well, how would we get more digits in there, right? Like, there's two, it's either a one or a zero, and really limits the bandwidth, right? Right. So, uh, jumping, you know, this is like the blockchain debate, you know, if you will. So, like, going from two digits or two different possible answers to four different possible an- answers per mm-hmm. per single digit or, or string space, whatever. Yeah, it squares the amount of... Uh of uh, possible uh, things you can store. Uh, I mean, the bandwidth, if you yeah. will. Like yeah, that too. Communicating, that too. whether it's communicating yeah. or storing or, or whatever, it's now four times as big using this sort of, uh, this sort of system versus... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, that's, that's what, the future of money. It might be in your DNA. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, who, who, who's to say? Yep. But, you know, one yep. thing I, I keep coming back to, and, and I go back to that editorial once more, and I, I said that the, that blockchains were the DNA of our society, will become the DNA of our society. And, and I think that when you look at the genetic structure and the, the genome, if you will, I look, it, it would be, appear like a, an organic blockchain, right? Mm-hmm. It's added to and changed based on right. various traits that affect or turn it on. But the blockchain is still there and intact. I- Right, everyone has this blockchain, but not all the traits are turned on, and they're all all the same. I, yeah, I think there's even philosophical uh, consequences of this blockchain. You know, like people might be upset that uh, life doesn't last forever. You know, people die, and, and very rightly so, people get upset about that. And I'm sorry if if that's affecting you right now, but uh, uh, like, but with this blockchain. Uh, it, you know how there's a transaction and it's in the block and it's kind of embedded for forever? Right. Well, if you've ever lost a lost lo- loved one, you know, they were interacting with the universe and they had an effect on the outcome and that's embedded in the universe forever. You can think of kind of blockchain philosophy sure. here. And uh, I, I think that's a very positive uh, thought process to have for all these transits. So you're embedded, you're, no matter how long you live, you're embedded in the blockchain of the, of the universe. <laughs> well, and we'll, we'll of course have a link up to uh, JJ's editorial that uh, was in between episodes 190 and 191. Blockchains will become the DNA of our future society, is what you said, JJ. Wow, that's right. That's Come full title. circle. So. so, yeah, I mean, this show is is great, and uh, so we want to do a quick crypto wrap up here. Yeah, I mean, we talked about a lot of things sort of surrounding crypto, but you know, there's been a lot of excitement this week. We don't report on prices, really. Well, we report on the prices at the beginning, but we don't speculate. We don't tell people to buy or sell anything. But certainly, there's once again pe- new people getting involved in cryptocurrency because we're seeing record highs. Uh, for Bitcoin, um, we're seeing a record high for Dash. I mean, Dash was at twenty two dollars right. last week, and that was uh, quite a bit up from where it's been for some time. And now it's up at uh, well forty five, and that's probably changed in the last half an hour. But forty three uh, fifty. But there was a really good post on um, Reddit, uh, the RBTC, that was just sort of a PSA reminder for people that. Um, you know, Bitcoin's been this high before, but it's also been a lot lower than this. So, you know, exercise caution. Don't invest any money, any more money than you can afford to lose in any kind of investment. But uh, it's definitely exciting times, and it is uh, a lot of fun to sort of watch where these prices may go and speculate. But, uh, you know, just just a reminder to be careful out there. They're, these are volatile. There's no central party controlling them. And once you spend your coins, you don't have them. And if you don't control the private keys, you don't control the coins. That's right. And yeah, it's, uh, you know that there's we don't want to speculate. We don't want to tell you what things are going to do. But I'll tell you. Then this is something we talked about before the show. Just as a generic thing, that w- in the four years we've been doing the show, Darren, something we've seen is is there's a sharp rise and people get involved and the volume goes crazy and then things come down. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes, yes, they they do come down. That's they happened come with down. Bitcoin. A and lot then, of times. And then oftentimes it'll go back up. That's not to say that yeah. it's going to hit that same peak. It's not to say it's going to stop at that same peak. But what I'm saying is that there's a lot of irrational behavior that is brought yeah. about by the volume generated by these price yeah. spikes. Uh, what people say about a time like this is irrational exuberance. Yes, <laughs> and, exactly. And uh, that probably is something that would apply right now. That Now, um, you know, just be, yeah. just be measured. Don't, 
don't take all your money and put it in one thing or, or three things or five things and make sure you understand what they are. If you just learned what it is, uh, don't use it. Uh, I mean, there's there's posts on forums like, oh, I think I got scammed. And from the language they use, it's clear they don't even know what they're doing. So, um, right. you know, you, you're sending your, you might be sending your money to some guy on the Internet, even if it's a fancy website. Um, now ju- the, just yeah. check and see if people are happy, you know, yeah. you know, check a Yelp review or the equivalent. Uh, I don't think there's many Yelp reviews for Bitcoin businesses, but there definitely are reviews. You can find people that use them and tell you what they think about it. And, well, and there's an Ethereum roadmap for 2017 we won't get into today, but we'll have the link up on eocashradio.com. They recently shared some of what they're proposing to do this year. Um, Bitcoin, I think people are watching to see if the uh, the, the famous Winklevoss twins are going to get their uh, ETF fund that's tied to Bitcoin, see if that gets approved. It's been on the docket since 2013, and uh, <laughs> was it the SEC that has to approve it? They've just been dragging their feet but uh, they've self-imposed a deadline of, I think, March 11th. So we'll be watching that as well. But there's definitely some speculation saying that that's what's causing part of the price rise for Bitcoin. Um, but as always, we will keep you posted here on Neocash Radio. Yeah, and, and what we some some of the uh, effects we're seeing in China is that after the, the halt of withdrawals, we're seeing local Bitcoins surging in China, the number of people using and signing up for local Bitcoins. Oh, yeah. And that brings us to what we were talking about before the show. So Bitcoin in Chinese is Bitabi which means like bit currency, digital currency. And uh, Dash is Dash uh, And that stands for of the kind of basically of the world currency. And so um, people are going to, in China, are going to be using a world currency called Dash B. Right. And, and I think that's set up to be marketed so much better because, um, because it's, it's translatable in their native language where Bitta is, a, is like a cognate. It's just a sound that was imported from English. And so I, I think that uh, the uh, the way uh, Dash has branded itself in America and in China is is quite uh, quite uh, clever. How about that? Well, I think clever. I like the word clever. It's yeah. a good word. Digital I think, cash. I, cash. I was flabbergasted when I looked that up. I had to look it up again today because I couldn't remember all the details. And it's yeah, so it's amazing. Excellent. Well, we we have been uh, talking about Dash for a while. You can check out our shows, and you can hear what we think about Dash and and all that. But just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast, Tag, LBRY, and more. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Neocashradio.com. Neocash Radio.